Hi guys, I hope you enjoyed very much uh, to see all those applications deploy with the software operator patterns. But now let's step back and let's uh, see how John, John Seeger, will uh, actually introduce uh, the model driver operations and named Juju. And uh, John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, as Cedric said, I'm John Seeger. I'm VP of Engineering for Enterprise Solutions at Canarco, which means I look after the development of Juju and a good number of the charm operators that you see in the charm hub today and the build tooling that's used for building uh, charms, snaps, and rocks. Um, I'm going to talk to you today and give a bit of an introduction into Juju, what Juju is, why it's kind of different to its competitors, and why I think the approach that we have taken is so promising. Um, but before I do that, I think it's important to take a look at the kind of problem space more broadly and, and, and try and understand what is the problem that we're actually faced with when trying to use open source. So I think it's probably safe to say that there has never been so much choice of great open source software. So, you know, 20 years ago, open source was kind of this weird thing in the corner that, you know, people didn't talk about and it was kind of hobby projects and it's really kind of exploded to the extent that I would argue that in reality, it's, it's almost becoming the default for a large part of the industry. Um, you know, if you need a SQL database, a NoSQL database, a graph database, observability tools, you know, machine learning tools, even operating systems, you can get them open source now. Um, you can pretty much think of any category of software that you need to work in, and there would probably be too many open source projects within that category for you to be able to remember or even know. Um, and whereas before there was a real kind of emphasis on small businesses and individuals, we're increasingly seeing large organizations move towards adopting open source, contributing to open source, and ultimately benefiting open source. Um, and these are not just hobby projects, right? These are not second-class citizens. These are giants like Linux, Postgres, Visual Studio Code, Grafana, right? Like real um, big hitting projects. So arguably deploying applications, just getting them running is kind of the easy bit, right? But most complex applications, most complex solutions are not composed of just a single component, right? You'll need databases, caches, event queues, metric scrapers, indexers, whatever it might be. And for each of these things, you'll have to configure them individually, work out how they kind of interact with one another as part of a software stack and kind of maintain that, right? You, and if you're doing this on one single cloud, that can often be difficult enough, let alone if you're kind of spanning multiple public clouds or elements of on-premise uh, kind of hybrid cloud situations. So let's assume that you managed to get your kind of day two operations sorted. You've managed to define your integrations and you're happy with how everything is working. How's that kind of automation, how's that setup going to evolve as the products evolve, right? As your various components release new versions, they have patch releases, they introduce new features, perhaps they change the protocol on a, on a given interface for kind of the integration between two pieces. Who's going to maintain your infrastructure as code and, and check that those integrations still work? So if you have a kind of disaster recovery scenario and you want to redeploy your infrastructure or move it elsewhere, are you going to be able to do that? Um, and who makes sure that you're kind of taking advantage of all of the latest, uh, I don't know, telemetry formats or um, uh, optimizations that you might find within database products? Um, and then the final point of concern is how about, you know, supporting uh, for security vulnerabilities, patching for security vulnerabilities as they're announced and rolling that out in a safe way across your infrastructure. So lots and lots of people have tried to tackle these problems over the years, and each of the tools that we see on the screen are incredibly kind of popular and successful in their own right. Um, and they're all pretty accomplished for your kind of day zero, day one. Um, and, and in fact, we even have integrations with some of them, right? So we have a Terraform provider for Juju, for example. But none of them kind of trivially solve the problem for how you operate this software at day two. And they don't provide much of a guardrail on how you integrate things together. They, they kind of expose to you a very raw set of configuration that allows you to get right down into the guts of these tools, but they don't necessarily provide a kind of streamlined answer for how you would, for example, configure Prometheus to scrape for metrics in your Postgres. Um, you know, so if you want to scale your database, well, figure that out for yourself, what the storage looks like, configuration, failover, alerting. If you want to, you know, run backups across all your apps, you can do it, but you kind of have to figure it out yourself. 
if you want to collect logs, metrics, and traces, while the applications themselves might be instrumented correctly, you're going to have to figure out how to configure that and wire it up yourself. Um, and so we're kind of hoping to build a better way, right, where it's less manual, more well-defined, and kind of easy to understand. And so while one might argue that the exponential growth of open source has really increased the availability of code, really helped the enterprise adopt it in any meaningful way, right? Without a really comprehensive understanding of how to deploy, integrate, and operate software, enterprises often perceive there being too much risk, right? You can't just go to GitHub, download some binary, and throw it into your infrastructure. They're more likely to go the route of going to a vendor, paying for support, paying for kind of lifecycle operations, that kind of thing. And so I think in order for us to really unlock the remaining potential in open source for enterprise infrastructure, at least, we've got to normalize open sourcing not just our applications, but also the kind of operational frameworks and guardrails around them. And child operators, which is the, the kind of packages that Juju deploys on the cloud, take all of the domain knowledge and expertise that would be required to you know, effectively operate a piece of software and distill that into clean, maintainable, testable Python code. Um, and so throughout this, you'll hear me referring to charms or charmed operators. And what they are is essentially packaged operations code for a given technology, right? Um, and we then try to keep as many of those as open source as possible. So we're developing open source charms for Postgres, for MySQL, for Grafana, for Loki, for Kubeflow. Um, and we build developer tooling around that ecosystem to help people package up their software that way and hopefully try to normalize the act of kind of open sourcing the operations code. And so Juju, like at its core, allows you to deploy any application at any scale on any platform or stop trade. So we support bare metal, we support Kubernetes, and that's any CNCF compliant Kubernetes. We support OpenStack, AWS, GCP, Azure, Oracle Cloud, VMware, Equinix, right? So a huge kind of supported base of cloud providers. And I think one of the key things is that you can use the same charm for lots and lots of different backing clouds, which gives you essentially unrivaled portability of your workflow. If you Juju deploy Postgres on Azure, well, it's just Juju deploy Postgres on AWS as well, right? There's no kind of special configuration you have to do. There's no deeper understanding you have to have of those two clouds. You just Juju deploy whatever the application is that you want. Um, and really the superpower here for, for kind of DevOps teams or even for ops teams is just to learn one set of tools that kind of translate seamlessly across the platforms that you have available, even if those underlying platforms change over time. Juju is, as far as I can tell, the only tool of its kind that allows you to deploy, integrate, and operate workloads with a completely consistent user experience. So at deploy time, Juju can build you VMs, it can provision bare metal machines, it can deploy containers on Kubernetes, and it can deploy into your AWS VPC. Once it's deployed, it gives you kind of a rich language for defining integrations between your applications, irrespective of their underlying cloud. So you might have your database on bare metal, but your Prometheus and Kubernetes, and you can configure those to speak very, very simply. Um, and these integrations are kind of codified into the charm code, right? So the, the developer of the operator for Postgres knows, hopefully, best how to integrate things like Prometheus metric scraping, and so that's all part of the operator code. Um, and of course, this is all completely open source, so you can go and inspect it. It's just nice, clean, easy to read Python code. Um, we also provide actions, which are kind of like a day two operations framework. So um, for performing kind of common operations, whether that might be compressing an index or um, updating signatures or adding a user or something like that, they're all part of the Python code too. Um, and we also provide a well-defined upgrade path that allows you to kind of operate essentially the full breadth of open source with confidence within your enterprise infrastructure, whatever that might be. So this is a slide to kind of illustrate how, quite how flexible Juju is. So on there's a few different scenarios here. On the far left, you see, you know, an AWS backing cloud where Juju has deployed Kubernetes on a set of VMs. And then on top of that Kubernetes, it's deployed Prometheus, Postgres, and Kafka. And then we move across to the kind of second in from the left, Canonical NAS. So this is a bare metal uh, instance. And Juju has deployed OpenStack on that bare metal. It's then deployed Kubernetes on that OpenStack. And then it's deployed the same application stack on top of that case. The Azure example here is we're just deploying those apps straight into Azure as virtual machines. And then there's the kind of arbitrary bring your own Kubernetes on the far right there where you just can deploy our charms using Juju onto, onto any Kubernetes. And 
the interesting thing about this picture is you could use a different Juju controller for each of these stacks. You could use one single Juju controller to manage all of these things, or you could use one Juju controller kind of per element of the stack, right? So it allows you to divide up responsibility and kind of um, distribute risk across your infrastructure to an extent, right? Like, uh, to, to kind of ensure availability and access to these things. And I think the key point here is that chant operators are fundamentally designed to be composed to solve problems. They're not necessarily designed to be operated in isolation as a recognition of the fact that these things are often not operated in isolation, right? Like it's, you wouldn't just deploy Prometheus, where right? like Prometheus is deployed to scrape something or for metrics to be sent to, right? You, and so we design our child operators in those, in the, with that in mind. So one benefit of adopting Juju is kind of portability. This has been a promise of configuration management tools forever, right? Particularly the kind of generation of infrastructure as code tools. And Juju is the kind of closest I've seen to the reality of write some infrastructure code and then deploy it anywhere. Um, I had a, a lot of experience in the past with Terraform, a tool which I admire and, and I'm a big fan of. But one of its drawbacks is it's so flexible and kind of provides so much detail around each individual cloud. If you write your code for AWS, you essentially have to completely start again if you want to move to Azure. Whereas with Juju, you write a charm for Postgres where you can deploy that on Azure, on AWS, on you know, LexD, whatever it is that you like. Um, there's one kind of bifurcation in our ecosystem at the moment, which is that we have a, and for each product, we have a different charm for Kubernetes. Um, we are working over the next kind of 18 to 24 months to, to iron that out. So it really is just one charm for everywhere. Right now you kind of have like a Postgres charm and a Postgres capes charm, for example. But essentially this gives this portability and this ability to have one set of charms for any Kubernetes and one set of charms for any machine-based cloud. It gives engineers, SREs, analysts, et cetera, the choice to deploy essentially to the most cost-effective or resource-rich or commercially suitable cloud, you know, for your particular situation. Um, and additionally, generally more workloads can be migrated across clouds and, and the integrations can be formed across them as well. Um, and I'll talk a bit about that now, right? So not all the clouds are born equal and that's that's absolutely fine. They each have things that they focus on particularly. If you want to run your web front end on Kubernetes, but you want to consume a managed caching service from AWS and you want to run your database on your bare metal kind of data center in your you know, on-premise, you can do that. Right? Like Juju allows you to do that. You can deploy each of those. You can deploy the things that you need to deploy on OpenStack and on Kates, and you can perhaps use Terraform to provision the thing you need on AWS and you can link it all together. Um, Juju is not going to solve the fundamental network connectivity problem, but it does simplify how applications communicate with one another. What are the things they need to exchange? What are the details, the, the parameters they need to exchange in order to communicate? And it, and it provides a bunch of primitives for those applications to be able to coordinate between each other throughout their life and ensure that those integrations kind of remain solid. The model abstraction within Juju makes it essentially trivial for your ops team to understand the dependencies within your architecture, right? Like you can essentially draw, you know, a pretty simple graph wire diagram on, you know, that shows, you know, you've got a Postgres here, a, a Prometheus there, you've got a WordPress over here, right? Like it, it, it's one set of abstractions, right? In that you have a Juju model, which is kind of like a namespace. Inside a model, you deploy applications and those applications can have, you know, zero or more units. And that set of primitives is consistent across all of the clouds that Juju supports, right? So you really only have to learn this language, if you will, once, and you can use it anywhere. Um, and our multi-cloud kind of cross-cloud integrations enable you to make the most of whatever infrastructure you might have available to you, right? Like whether it's what your enterprise can afford, what they've built in their own data center, or, or whichever cloud they've partnered with for whatever reason. Charm Hub is kind of the center of this ecosystem. It's where charms can be published. It's where you can read their docs. It's where you can understand how they're configured. Um, and it's got an ever-growing list of first-class applications from the open source world, a good number of which on the display now are being worked on actively by Canonical, right? Like we're staffing teams to build first-class operators for these technologies. Um, there is a, a growing uh, community contribution as well. Um, and the idea is that Charm Hub kind of becomes the go-to destination for when you need to, you know, go and get another piece of your infrastructure, whatever that might be. Um, and while I think Charm operators should be absolutely great on their own, you'll note that a theme throughout this has been how they can be integrated to solve problems. How can they be composed across clouds to, to essentially build bigger solutions? And that's where bundles come in, right? So 
we Jiju has this notion of bundles, which is a way of defining a set of charms to be deployed and, and those and the integrations between them right up front, right? So you could essentially um, declaratively say, I want to lay down these charms with these integrations, with these constraints, et cetera, with this config. Um, so anyone can write bundles to compose charms from Charm Hub. You can publish your bundles to Charm Hub where you can deploy them locally. It's up to you. And we use this for distributing um, some of our own productized solutions like the canonical observability stack, which is in the center there. So that takes things like Prometheus, Grafana, Alert Manager, Loki, and, and binds them all together into a kind of product offering. Kubeflow is a kind of bundle for taking Kubeflow and the 30 something Microsoft the microservices that make it up and basically making it deployable to any Kubernetes as, as quickly and as easily as possible. And Charmed Magma is a solution for building and operating 5G um, mobile core network. Uh, and, and each of these have kind of had a, a various stages in their life cycle. Magma is a relatively complex example, and it took the team probably about 12 months to get to a fully working kind of proof of concept there. But it's ready for you to deploy. And it is, in fact, the only way that is documented by the Magma project to deploy on anything other than just AWS. So by writing the charm, and because Juju has this like very solid notion of what a Kubernetes charm is, suddenly... The, the Magma project gained this portability to be able to deploy to any CNCF compliant Kubernetes rather than just to EKS, for example. So um, this is really a call to action, right? To get involved um, where you're in for a bit of a day where you'll learn a bit about Charmed Operates development. You'll learn about integrations with the rest of the ecosystem like Terraform. You'll hear from some of our partners, um, but you can get involved almost immediately. So we have the, the charmlove.io page, which I spoke about is kind of our store and our catalog, if you will. There's also the discourse forum where you will find, you know, the developers in our own teams, including the GD developers hanging out. You'll find release notes, you'll find announcements. You can kind of get assistance from the store team if you need it. And if you prefer a kind of more real time, um, synchronous type communication, then you can join chat.charmlove.io, which is in fact a Mattermost instance deployed with Juju on a Kubernetes. Um, and so you can come there and hang out with us, talk with the Juju developers, talk with me, whatever it is um, that you need. So I now need to kind of wish you goodbye. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and I'll hand back now to Cedric, who will introduce the next act. <laughs>